Hello. I'm going to talk to you about my new piece, Raft of the Medusa. Raft of the Medusa. Here's an image of the whole piece, which was just finished in uh, the beginning of April 2021. The original painting, Raft of the Medusa by Theodore Jericho, depicts the survivors of the wreck of the ship Medusa. It's a painting I've adored for a long time. I do not wish for anyone to compare my piece to that one, as I am not capable, nor all that interested, to be honest, in that type of painting. But I did think I could contribute to the genre somehow. Of which genre do I speak? Why the shipwrecked on a life raft as a metaphor for life genre, that one. Another influence is this print, Battle of the Naked Men by Antonio del uh, Paolo. Pa I'm just guessing. According to Wikipedia, who quote Vasari endlessly, this print was a big deal in the Renaissance. As a woman of the 21st century, I like it because it's a pile of nude dudes for a change behaving rather badly. What's not to like? Third influence is the tessellated patterns of M.C. Escher. My piece tessellates, sort of. I'll get into that. <clears throat> the drawings actually do tessellate, but the window suggests the tessellation without doing it exactly. Um, some prior influences. I've done battle scenes since I was a painting major in 1981. This is a sketch for this painting called Ship of Fools. And you can see that it is heavily influenced by these major forces <clears throat> that I was exposed to in my journeyman years as an artist. Here's another battle scene that I did circa 1982. This is also oil paint on the, a board. And then there's this painting, which is rather huge. It's four feet by five feet rectangular. And it was based in part, at least on the Raider Waite tarot deck 10 of swords image, which indicates a major disaster of some sort. And more recently, I did this piece, the Battle of Carnival in Lent. So I have a long history of doing these battle scenes. Several years ago, something unusual happened to me. I had an idea. When that happens, which is not often, I make a sketch, which these days means a placeholder in my computer to remind me of this momentous event. This consists of a folder with some sort of a Photoshop document in it. And this is what this folder has in it currently. In this case, the drawing I put in that folder was super crude. I took a bunch of figures from old sketches. I made them into a pile willy nilly with zero thought as to if it was working or not and filed it into my hard drive where I would hopefully run into it again someday. The beast, arose from its slumber in the summer of 2020, right in the middle of COVID. Basically, I decided that I would make a real drawing of this idea. I did the actual sketch with pencils. I'm sure you remember them. But if you don't, well, there's a pencil. At this point, I have about 10 ways of drawing. I doodle in ballpoint pen, I mess around in Photoshop, and I do the occasional meticulous pencil drawing. Please note that meticulous pencil drawings are not a necessary step in stained glass design process. You can make windows out of scrawlings on napkins if you so desire. So if you are a student of stained glass, don't feel you have to have a complete drawing. The pencil drawing I did looked like this. That's after some labor went into it. <clears throat> but that's not all. I should mention that when I first drew it, lightning struck and I had the sudden desire, and yes, this felt urgent, to make it an endlessly repeating block. This is not something that one can have a digital program just do with the click of a button, or if there is an app for this, I don't know about it. 
So in order to make it repeat endlessly, I first had to make more figures, which you see in this corner here. And then I actually moved them to the bottom of the drawing so that I could imagine them on a, a raft a little bit better. And here's the full repeating design. So you can see, yes, it really does endlessly repeat in all directions. This is it repeated about four times. Apropos of burning urges, I also wanted to do this in color. That entails separating each figure so that I can paint them in Photoshop. And then after I did that, I recompiled them with an emphasis on pile. As for the technical hoo-ha, making it repeat sounds simple, but it's not. It actually took days on end. So finally, here it is, the perfect wallpaper for your powder room or home abattoir. And because this is the project that will never end, I made a digital version as well. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> this lives in my hard drive. Having completed all these drawings, I let it rest for several months while working on other projects. And here are some loving close-ups of that wallpaper, which yes, it really could be generated as a wallpaper. After I finished the drawings, uh, I did make a tiny version of this for inclusion in an exhibition at Shelter in Place Gallery. This is eight inches by six inches. And this is the gallery. The gallery is the size of a dollhouse. It's a scale model and it's incredibly realistic. So my piece looks gigantic, but actually that is it. Then a few months ago, I commenced to work on a big window. The first thing that happened was I totally rejected the image of the people piled up on, on a raft, as well as the original wallpaper idea. Why? I can't really answer that. I guess it had a shelf life and I was sick of it. That happens. I wanted the best of everything. I still wanted a pile, but not too specific a pile. And I wanted it to repeat, but not exactly. Also, the heads, which I tend to exaggerate and make too large, I wanted to make them a little more proportional in this piece. So this is what I came up with. This is the same exact drawing. Because it tessellates, you can see it in two configurations, this or this. Then I needed a cutting pattern, also known as a cartoon. Traditional window cutting schemes use the edges of the figures to create a coloring book like image where the outlines of what's in the picture determine the cut lines for the glass. But hey, that has been done to death, including by me. And of course, there are a million other ways to cut stained glass. I decided to collaborate with my partner, Glenn Carter by stealing one of his designs and adapting it to mine. This is the specific section that I basically stole. It's a little hard to tell, but I really did use this as my cutting pattern. I wanted to suggest fragmentation of human relations and with hindsight also to suggest here are all these people struggling to get along or break apart or whatever, when the real problem is the conflicting and insensitive structure which defines their environment. Lead lines is social constrictions, if you will. The piece is constructed entirely of double strength float glass, which is regular window glass, a little thicker. It is the most soulless, nasty manufactured product, which has zero business being in stained glass windows, were it not for its unbelievable uniformity of surface, which lends itself so well to glass painting. And here is all the glass cut out, and I have sandblasted every surface. Uh, I have also transferred the drawing onto the glass using a fine point Sharpie. This shows the first part of the paint process. Basically, I have wiped the surfaces with a brownish black paint to create a mat and then sort of wiped it off. You can still see the uh, magic marker lines, and, uh, but there is a sort of a tone over everything. 
And then I have traced the marker lines with glass paint using a script liner brush. So this is the glass paint and now it is no longer magic marker. And then I fired it in my kiln at a temperature of about 12, 25 degrees Fahrenheit. After the firing, I uh, put highlights on the figures using engraving tools and diamond files. And then I painted more. And this is the process that I used for painting in a nutshell. I paint, I fire it on, I engrave, then I paint some more, then lather, rinse, repeat on and on until I am satisfied. For you curious glass painters, there are probably up to eight or nine firings per section, plus a lot of the engraving and filing. Check out my other videos for more information on my process. Finally, the pieces assembled the traditional way using lead canes. Now, before I get to the glaring subject matter of this piece, here's a brief discussion of my specific design concerns in this particular one. <clears throat> Not this particular one pictured in the one we're talking about, Raft of the Medusa. I started with the idea of a pile of people, you will recall. I have an urge to depict piles of things or interlocking things. What is this about? I read somewhere, and I deeply regret that I can't remember where, that many of um, their abstract, that, that many of the doodlings that a person is compelled to do resemble nothing so much as biological phenomenon that is happening in our own heads. Who knows what we'll figure out in terms of how the brain encodes self-generated images in the future. I certainly look forward to whatever it is. But for now, I can just say, I have the urge to do these piles of things and I don't think it has a Freudian explanation. Despite the contemporary pressure for an artist to analyze themselves to death, I am going to reclaim the following. My work is an attempt to know myself and by extension to understand others and the entire world outside my brain. Any claims of a priori conclusions would be absurdly premature. In other words, I work intuitively and am utterly in service to my self-conscious. And although they, meaning neurologists, will never locate a collective subconscious in the brain, it's metaphorically true enough, so suck it up, buttercup. I hope you enjoyed that little bit of art speak, which roughly translates to, I have no clue. Perhaps related to that urge is a strong urge to do repeating tessellated patterns. Also no clue, but I would suggest that much of what a brain wants to do is draw pictures of itself and that is often strangely mathematical. Pattern in visual art is close to rhythm in music. It's a biological imperative. Since there are patterns in nature, we presumably have developed the ability to pick up on that for a reason. And so to do that delights us. Nature ensures our acting in our own interests with a reward in the form of a jolt of delightful brain chemicals. And I would say, Pattern perception is part of that. As for the combined narrative content of my piece, in other words, the subject matter, first off, I will explain it, but first a caveat. In discussing, analyzing, or critiquing art, the urge to understand subject matter or narrative content as somehow separate from design and material concerns has got to stop. I realize I am probably rushing right into that exact trap, but anyway, <clears throat> subject matter alone is not concept, and concept is not a synonym for meaning. So just stop it, people, would you? The meaning of a work of art is in its gestalt. The experience of its subject, design, and material all play integral parts and all generate aspects of the meaning. It's not just the subject matter. 
wrapped with the Medusa, was a very direct attempt to come to terms with the extremely traumatic summer of 2020. It wasn't just traumatic for me, for everyone. This time period, I know you haven't forgotten and won't for a long time, was marked by social isolation due to COVID and social unrest uh, owing to responses to the murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter protests. To crowd or not to crowd, that was the question. And for many, it became worth it to demonstrate that some issues are worth risking death for. So demonstrate some people did. Donald Trump and his policies and administration filled me and many, many others and artists with the urge to say something. Why is it so hard to get along? I think we do want to love one another, but it's so very, very difficult. Even loving a single other person is a difficult task that involves facing one's shadow self. <clears throat> and Never mind trying to love all of humankind as a kind of clump. Loving your neighbors? Well, loving your neighbor is probably the hardest thing to ask in the whole world. How can I possibly love my neighbors? What if they are smokers or hoarders or vote differently or have different beliefs? I have always thought that disapproving of one's neighbors in other words, others, is not really about them anyway, but about coming to terms with the parts of ourselves that are the most hard to reconcile and to love. Being angry with your neighbor is the single most effective strategy to avoid recognizing the parts of yourself that you hate, but that's because it's easy. They neighbors are, by definition, strange and alien. And you can consolidate your love for your family and friends at their expense without threat. And I mean that without a ton of judgment. It's kind of our default setting and it's hard to change. Last summer, even diehard, soft-hearted liberals were unfriending their friends and neighbors and families on Facebook over social policy disagreements, you remember. And all this played out with a deadly pandemic urging us to isolate, hide, duck and cover. We have met the enemy and he is virus us. COVID brought this all out and it's not a coincidence it all happened at once. I'm not trying to be moralistic or preachy, I don't wanna tell people how to think, just maybe make some little suggestions. So I made a picture, which I hope expresses and externalizes the all too human struggle to deal with our fear and aggression towards others, our loved ones, and ultimately our own selves. It's all the same fear. That which I imagine to be outside of myself is always within and to come to terms with that is the essence of love. In the image, I included a lot of people struggling and writhing in discomfort and disease, together and alone. And they're all stuck together on this tiny raft, not actually pictured. And there are even some moments of tenderness if you look for them. As for the subject matter and why it might resonate at this moment beyond what I've already said, I will let you decide if it does and how and why it does that. Suffice it to say, I was pretty concerned with any attempt by me to represent humanity, but I decided to try anyway. It's one of the more presumptuous parts of an artist's job description. Plus there's the irony about figurative art that ensures that it will always upset, offend and outrage people which I think explains a lot about iconoclasm, a topic I would like to take a deep dive into at some point, but not now. So why is it that figures upset everybody? Because figurative artists have only two choices and they both kind of suck. <clears throat> represent oneself or represent the other, meaning anyone who isn't them. I have always tried to dodge this catch-22 with what is a semi-viable third option, imaginary people. But this piece is supposed to be about humankind. So I had to depict people other than my own proxies. 
I will sum this topic up by pointing out that humanity seems to currently be a writhing mass of fear, despair, confusion, rage, and discontent, or at least it was in the summer of 2020. As an artist, I hope actually to present a venue for contemplation, which is a safe place, a nice thing to look at, or perhaps better stated, that I deliberately provide aesthetic incentives for looking. And maybe those are beauty, humor, I don't know, whatever. Not that there's anything funny about what we have, were contending with and are contending with still, because there isn't. But art hides behind the fourth wall and the artifice is one of its best strategies to sneak into your consciousness and give people a platform to make actual change. And aesthetics, including beauty and humor, encourage active and sustained engagement with a subject that can otherwise be unbearable. Note on the figures. I made the decision to use characters from existing artworks rather than draw new people. If you're sort of some compulsive follower of my work, you'll recognize almost all of these characters from older stained glass pieces. There's Andromeda, who was uh, now a uh, person of color, and some characters from the Battle of Carnival and Lent, amongst others. <clears throat> Why did I do this? Two reasons. First of all, doing about 40 new humans would probably take me a few years. Sketches I mind represent about 15 years worth of work. These characters are like dolls that I like to play with. One doesn't just throw a doll in the trash can after they've played with it only once or twice. There's plenty of life left in it. I would see these drawings as a waste of a good doll if they only had one role to play. Imagine perhaps that they're real people who after doing their job in the original window in which they appeared, left my pieces, continued their lives, and perhaps at some point planned a reunion on a cruise ship where they would reminisce and relive the trauma of having their non-existent lives exploited in one of my Perils of Pauline style artworks. But their reunion goes horribly wrong. There's a storm at sea, a shipwreck, a mad scramble to the life raft and the inevitable stress of too many people and too few resources. My poor dolls expecting a three hour pleasure cruise and ending up as an allegory of human struggle to survive in isolation on the metaphorical raft of humanity or inhumanity as it may be. And that I think is all I have to say about this piece. Thank you very much.